Hello and welcome to Reportage. This is Danish Bin Nabi. In today's segment of Reportage, I am joined by author and historian Mr. Manu Bhagwan, who has recently released the book Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, published by Penguin House. It is the first definitive biography of Vijay which traces her contribution first towards India's independence and then in building the new India post-independence. More from the author. Mr. Manu, why did you write the book on Vijaya when talking about Nehru house is considered to be blasphemy in present day setup. What was the need of writing such a voluminous book? Um, well, uh, first of all, Danish, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, well, I'll tell you why I wrote the book, which whatever the views of other people are today, uh, I, I think that's sort of incidental. I mean, my interests are what they are. And um, I also think that there are certain reasons uh, for her story being of value today. Um, and so those are the things I'll tell you about. Um, let me first back up, though, just a little bit um, and take note of the fact that in her day, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit was universally renowned and respected, or virtually so at least. And that held true uh, around the world and also in India. Uh, and so it is of note that uh, she had uh, excellent relations with people on the far left and on people on the right. Um, she, she had very good relationship. She had a very good relationship with Shama Prasad Mukherjee and with Atal Bihari Vajpayee, for example, uh, on the right wing. Um, and um, even though I'm, I might be clear here that she disagreed with them uh, on a variety of issues, as she did with the, the far, far left as well sometimes. Um, uh, she um, also was recently, uh, the, the Ministry for Information and Broadcasting put out a video uh, which talked about how important and great that she was. Um, the government's Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. So, I mean, I think that uh, her appeal continues through today across the ideological spectrum. Um, and that's because she uh, stood up for values that she believed in. Let me tell you a little bit about why I wrote the book. Uh, so the story goes like this. Um, several years ago, um, I was in my office at Hunter College and um, a co colleague of mine walked into my into my uh, room Room and um, produced a book that he had just written and uh, handed it to me and said that he thought that I would find this of particular interest. And I, I looked at it. It was a book on American race relations. And I am interested in this topic, but I wasn't quite clear why I would be particularly interested in it. And so I kind of looked at him a little bit and asked him what this was about. And he, he sort of tapped it and he said, well, Madam Pandit, Madam Pandit. And I had no idea who he was talking about. It was very embarrassing. Um, and I took it. I was like, Madam Pandit, who is this? Uh, and I, you know, it took me a minute, took me a little bit to realize, oh, he's talking about Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. Now, even though I knew the name, I, it didn't mean anything. I was like, okay, it's Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, the, you know, Nehru sister, but I, I had no connection. I didn't know that she had anything to do with the United Nations. I didn't know anything. It was very embarrassing. Um, and so I had to sit with that embarrassment for a little bit. Embarrassment is a, is a, is a hard feeling to, to grapple with, but it can be very useful if you take it with some humility. Embarrassment is a signal usually that you don't know something. And I had to acknowledge, here's something I don't know. And I had to sit with why I didn't know this. Um, uh, and so, you know, there's really only one course of action when you're faced with that kind of thing. And that's to figure out what you don't know and to, to try to learn about it. So I grew interested uh, in her story a bit, and I sort of left that there. Um, I was doing some research for my next project, uh, and um, I encountered the papers of Hansa Mehta, which was a transition from my first book. And as I was reading that, I saw Hansa Mehta's work at the United Nations, and that led me back to Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. So I went through her papers at Thinmurti. Uh, this grew into my book called The Peacemakers, um, which I published. And after I published that book, I still felt that there was a lot, lot more to the story. Yeah. Yes, and I've only cracked the tip of the iceberg. So um, I, I, anyway, the book came out and I was doing something else, another project again. And I 
I was sitting in my dining room and I turned to my partner, my wife, and I, I said to her, you know something? And she looked at me and I said, well, I'm very interested in what I'm doing, but the truth is what I really want to do is write a biography of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit and I would love to do it for Penguin. I don't know why I said that. That was just how I felt. And she looked at me and she said, okay. And, you know, we just sort of left it there, just sort of sat there. And about a week or so later, out of the blue, Penguin wrote to me and asked me if I would be interested in writing a biography of Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. And, uh, and I... It was a coincidence, right? Yeah, I, the universe had spoken. And so I said, well, clearly, I, this is what I am meant to do. And that is how I... Uh, that, that's a true and story. that is by how me. this wonderful biography came. Yes, exactly. If we, if we see her career, she was a diplomat, she was a politician, she was a philanthropist, she was everything. So as yes. to say, but why is it that people, the students, the politicians across the polit across the spectrum have almost forgotten her legacy? Why is it so? Uh, well, I think there are two parts to this answer. Um, the first has to do with the fact uh, that she was fr quite frankly a woman. Um, and so a lot of her achievements were um, sort of brushed under the carpet um, as as, as people grappled with what we might call the great men of history and but things that there she is also Sarojini Naidu, there is also examples of Indira Gandhi and other people. They were not brushed yeah. under the carpet. Yes, I, I, I'll come to that. Just one second. So, so part of it is part of it is that she's a woman. Also, in her field, uh, which is diplomacy, international relations, these these areas, uh, it was easy to sort of you know, give credit to the, the people around her. She was surrounded by other big personalities like Krishna Menon, for example. And so um, a, a lot of that was shunted aside uh, in, in favor of these these other people. Secondly, she was, in fact, she had a she had a rivalry with Krishna Menon and was outmaneuvered by him uh, for a good period of time. Uh, and so in measure, uh, some of it stems from that. But the primary reason has to do with the fact that at the tail end of her career, Indira Gandhi, as you know, suspended democracy and initiated an emergency, uh, placing Vijay Lakshmi Pandit uh, under house arrest and doing all the things that uh, uh, Mrs. Gandhi did during the emergency. It was Vijay Lakshmi Pandit who said that this was a problem and after a period of time really came out in full charge swinging. Um, to defend democracy against uh, Indira Gandhi, and Mrs. Gandhi never forgave her for that. So when she returned to power after her defeat in 1977, came back in 1980, um, she sort of vindictively, actively erased uh, her aunt from history. And this is most apparent uh, if one visits Anand Bhavan today, Anand Bhavan, the former home of the Nehru's, uh, uh, where Vijay Lakshmi uh, grew up. Uh, if you go and visit the site today, it's 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 a museum essentially to Indira Gandhi uh, and, and to Nehru and Vijay Lakshmi is just a ghost in the house. Um, and so this is a great example of how she uh, sort of has been has been wiped from the narrative. But the book is to here to restore restore her full legacy. Completely. I completely get it. Before we move on to the independent India. There is a lot of and great contributions from uh, non Pandit as far as the British India is concerned and as far as the freedom movement is concerned. Kindly talk a bit for the new readers, for the students, how basically she helped the Congress people, especially uh, Nehru, her brother, in achieving India its mm, its uh, rights. <clears throat> Um, this is so, this is before independence. Yes. Yes. So um, she played several roles um, uh, when she was very young. Uh, I mean, uh, she sort of was in the backdrop, learned a lot, uh, came to know and admire uh, particularly fierce women like Annie Besant and Sarojini Naidu, um, and held them up in high esteem. Um, eventually. Eventually, she would grow close to Mahatma Gandhi. Um, but uh, she spent um, much of the 20s sort of involved with her newly married life and and, and that kind of thing. Uh, she's, she sort of really gets uh, driven into politics um, 
sort of late in the 20s and, and the 30s to be to take a much more active role. Um, and uh, she, she starts to be a star campaigner. The, the, the Congress sort of sees the value in sending her abroad. Uh, she has all of the talents that she would later in her life, which is she's a very charismatic speaker, very elegant, uh, and she has this ability to connect with people. Um, for her efforts, she's placed in prison three times. She has three stints in prison uh, for um, her anti-colonial activities. Um, uh, probably the biggest thing that she does in this period, she becomes, she, uh, well, she, she's after standing for the municipal board in Allahabad and being very successful at that, she stands for election in the late 1930s um, and uh, becomes the first woman cabinet minister in India in UP. Um, and there she holds um, portfolios of self-government and public health. Uh, and um, this is really the big breakthrough position because it's really the first time a woman uh, has held a cabinet position with serious portfolios in the entire British Empire. Um, and so she uh, becomes a, an international figure from there. Um, and that draws a lot of attention to the Congress. So all of her activities draw international attention now. Uh, and from there, she's, you know, she's uh, fearless in criticizing uh, British control and efforts, even though she has very good relationships with many Britons personally. Uh, she doesn't think that they should continue on. Um, and uh, uh, in her role as cabinet minister, she uh, expands access to health care um, and uh, takes on um, kind of historic patriarchy in the state. And, and one of the biggest things she does is she battles a, a cholera epidemic uh, in Haridwar um, and to the point of real exhaustion, but battles it back. It's a very significant achievement. Um, so all of this brings her international acclaim. Um, and then she uses that on the international stage to bring more attention to India. During this period also, she has been arrested for an attempt on murdering Mussolini, Italian's uh, dictator. Talk yes. about a bit, uh, how did she get into it? <clears throat> right, uh, well, well, this is uh, somewhat of a, of, um, uh, it's a somewhat humorous, somewhat scary story. Uh, she was traveling abroad with her husband, Ranjit, um, and uh, she's traveling abroad with her husband, Ranjit, um, uh, on on a kind of leisurely trip, um, and she um, is is basically she. They get to Rome, uh, and their intention is just to spend the day uh, looking at museums and enjoying kind of the great history and culture and art of the city. Um, and uh, they wind up uh, in one particular museum, and right at that moment, Mussolini is uh, outside uh, and uh, there is an attempt on his life. Um, this is, it's sort of incidental. It's someone else who uh, uh, sort of fires a gun at him. He leans back when that happens. So the bullet misses him and just grazes his nose and he just sort of carries on. But in that moment, they seal everyone up in the museum and then they determine that it's possible that she and her husband, uh, Vijay Lakshmi and her husband, may have had something to do with the assassination. So they uh, 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 put them in custody um, and uh, and detain well, how them. How much time she is in the custody and how finally she gets released? It's not very long. Um, you know, I mean, they, they just sort of place them in custody and they're not quite sure what to do. Um, but, uh, you know, um, Ranjit uh, knows Italian. He tries to explain to them that they're just tourists. Uh, and that, um, you know, that's, that has nothing to do with them, but it's th the Italians don't buy that. Uh, so it is a very serious moment, um, but she's sort of, uh, it's, it's a case of mistaken identity, really. She, she has nothing to do with it, but she's there. Um, and uh, what they, they have to decide on what to do, um, and uh, their only way out, um, because... Uh, they're part of the British Empire is to call the British representative there and say, look, can you just tell them that we're we don't have anything to do with this? Uh, and that's 
they they don't they find that a very difficult thing to do because by that point uh, they didn't accept the legitimacy of the British uh, in India and so um, but they don't have a choice that's what they do and through that particular uh, call um, they 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 get released hang on um, the, the one thing I would say is so in a sense this is just a uh, kind of an incidental episode. You know, here she's she's just sort of swept up in this. But it is emblematic of something else. Although it's just a kind of incidental for funny little episode, um, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, uh, essentially from that point forward, um, is really aware of the danger posed by fascism. And... Uh, and keenly aware of its uh, uh, association ultimately with Nazism as well. Um, and so it is, so, so as Hitler in Germany grows in power, um, the West sort of is oblivious to this. So um, several years later, this is after now the episode with cholera in Haridwar, um, she is exhausted, she comes to Europe, um, and she finds herself then um, sitting in Czechoslovakia right when the Sudeten crisis is, is going on. That's when uh, Hitler is attempting to take over um, the Sudeten land of Czechoslovakia. So uh, the Runciman mission is taking place, that's Britain's representative trying to negotiate peace, and she's staying right next door. And why this is significant is this is the moment that Chamberlain declares peace for for our time at the end of this, the Munich Pact, and what we sort of today know as the moment of appeasement when Britain appeases um, the Nazis. Uh, so she's outside 10 Downing Street when that occurs, when he gives this speech. Uh, and she knows deep down that this is um, really wrong. So the way history is written, here's a great example. You asked how people don't know what she did. Um, well, the way history has been written until now, so what happens is Chamberlain gives that speech, and um, in British history, the next thing that happens is that Winston Churchill is the person who really knows that the fascists are a real danger, and he warns everyone uh, in a famous speech, uh, and that's what sort of gets the ball rolling on, on the British side. So, um, but in fact, um, the night before Winston Churchill gives that speech, um, uh, a number of British politicians and activists uh, um, in, in um, the country host Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, and Nehru is there as well, and um, she delivers remarks, um, and her brother compliments her remarks as well, um, that are a, a scathing indictment of uh, of Chamberlain's appeasement policies and a warning about the dangers of fascism. Both she and Nehru had been very consistent about these dangers uh, uh, over this you know, window. Um, and that is carried in the papers the next morning. The next morning is the very day that Churchill then gives his speech. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to see that a lot of the remarks of Churchill, this is just coincidence, it's not that he's necessarily copying her, but uh, a lot of the remarks that he then makes is very similar to what she had said, and that is covered in the papers that day. So um, the point is, uh, of all this, is that the, that episode with Mussolini, where she's arrested, um, it, even though she doesn't have anything to do with it in a direct way, um, it does set up, it, it's kind of the, the beginning of this long-standing, consistent opposition to fascism that she um, exhibits the rest of her life. And which we see at the end, end time, at his end, and at her end times in eighties and seventies uh, and eighties. Before we move on to seventies and eighties, talk a bit about uh, her relationship with Pandit Nehru. Was Pandit Nehru instrumental and fundamental in sending her abroad to get all these exposures, so that once the uh, in uh, rather the nineteen fifties, she was obviously out of the country representing India at UN, US, then the Russia. Was it deliberate on the part of uh, Mr. Nehru to send her abroad? <clears throat> well, um, when she's younger, she goes abroad with her husband on kind of leisurely trips. And that's what leads to some of this at the very early stage. Uh, 
then uh, when she's a cabinet minister, she goes abroad for her health. Um, she, she's, uh, she suffers from a lot of the activities that she does, and she has some personal health crises as well. And so she, uh, she goes to Europe in part to recover. Um, and that's not, that's not a passing thing. She really needs, um, you know, sort of rest and recuperation, and she's treated by doctors abroad. Uh, so those are some of the initial reasons why she does that. But she, because of her breakthrough position as the first woman cabinet minister in India, um, and the first with serious portfolios in the British Empire, she has an international reputation by that point. Uh, and uh, she's she picks up a lot of interest. So um, the, the main transition point, funnily enough, happens uh, just a touch later over 1944 and 1945. Um, and what happens is that um, because of World War II, um, travel is very restricted. Um, the Changs, that's Chiang Kai-shek and Madam Chang, come to visit India in the context of World War II, hoping to get India to sign on to the war effort. In the context of that visit, Madam Chang uh, suggests that uh, Vijay Lakshmi send her elder daughters to Wellesley College in the United States. Uh, and this then happened. So Chandraleka and Nayantara wind up going to school in the United States. Um, after Ranjit dies uh, because of conditions in prison, um, Vijay Lakshmi really is keen on sort of getting to visit her daughters. Uh, and um, uh, some possibility uh, arises in 1944 that she's able to do that and maybe make some um, have a, some speaking engagements while she's there. So she's sent abroad to sort of represent India um, at the Pacific Affairs Conference, and this was going to let her go see her her daughters. But as soon as she gets there, she gets involved in a national speaking tour. Um, and why this is very significant is that while she's doing this, um, local black leaders. Um, uh, sort of see her as a visionary kind of spokesperson, and they ask her to represent the anti-colonial cause at the San Francisco conference, which is where the new United Nations is going to be created. Um, and uh, in the process of these conversations, she winds up on a radio program in New York called the Town Hall of the Air, um, and there she debates a man named Robert Boothby. So you remember that speech that Winston Churchill gave criticizing fascism? Well, the reason why he gave that speech is because his parliamentary secretary, a man named Robert Boothby, had warned Churchill himself of the dangers of Hitler. So it's that same Robert Boothby that's in the United States, and Vijay Lakshmi debates him on this radio station about uh, the need for empire, and she completely just defeats him. Defeats it's, it's him. A, it's a, she, she flattens him is the word that's used. Um, and uh, she emerges kind of a real superstar from this. So this whole trip to the United States, she really emerges as this kind of phenomenon um, uh, and uh, attracts kind of a, an incredible level of celebrity in the United States. That is why when she comes back uh, shortly after this trip, comes back to India, um, Nehru Gandhi uh, and uh, the British themselves are interested in sending her back to represent India at the new United Nations as the leader of the delegation. And uh, the charge, the portfolio she's given is to take on South Africa um, for um, some legislation that they've passed, which is discriminatory. Um, and she takes on that portfolio, also comes to a, a, a legendary victory. Um, and those things, in, those things combined, her trip her first trip, the tour, uh, her defeat of Boothby, her, her standing at San Francisco, and then again, her defeat of South Africa um, at the United Nations. That is what then leads um, uh, Nehru and uh, the government um, and others to say that she should be an ambassador of the country. Uh, and they select her uh, to become India's first ambassador to the Soviet Union. On personal level, how was the relationship between Nehru and uh, Vijay? Right. Um, so, I mean, she adored him. She adored him, admired him. Uh, he was he was the person. Uh, he was her hero. 
uh, from the time she was essentially her, her earliest memories. Um, he wasn't there in the house when she was very, very little because he was studying abroad. So uh, he lived through notes in, that he'd written in the books uh, in the library of Anandbhavan, and she would sort of read those and use the notes as a as a cue and a guide to her study um, of the texts there. And she, uh, so she, she sort of always held him up on a pedestal. They maintained a very close personal relations all the way through. Now, having said that, they, they had a great personal relationship. They didn't always agree. She sometimes disagreed with him. Uh, and, um, you know, she would but do her own thing. But that disagreement between brother and sister was respected from both the ends. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. In respect well, to what we saw between niece and the aunt. Precisely. Um, the the it, 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 the core essence of their relationship. Was in the other words, was, in other words, meaning Nehru was more democratic, more democrat than the Indra. Definitely, uh, that, that's sort of unquestionably true. But but I but there is a moment where there is this sort of does there is distance that grows between them, and that is over the course of the nineteen fifties, when Krishna Menon, as everyone knows, he has this incredibly close relationship with Nehru. Um, and he leans in on this position and he creates a fissure between Vijay Lakshmi and her brother. And uh, there's a noticeable difference, distance between them that just keeps growing and growing and growing. Uh, and so uh, the, the question really is, um, how, how does he manage to do this? Is it real? It absolutely is real. She, she writes and is sort of consistent uh, both privately and publicly uh, with Nehru that she doesn't understand why this distance is growing. Um, she continues to sort of say her bit, but she loses his ear and he he stops listening to her for a good period of time in this period. Um, and it it takes a long time uh, for for that kind of rift to be healed. She, she's very uh, she, she's very direct and blunt about it at the end, and she says, "This is what's happened," and you know he. Menon has played this role, uh, and it, in her view, had poisoned the relationship. Uh, but they, um, uh, and he had stopped listening to her. To be clear, he he wasn't he wasn't Nehru was no longer listening to Vijay Lakshmi. He was leaning into to Menon. Um, but but this uh, ultimately um, it does not harm their. Let me be clear: does not harm their personal relationship. They continue to have very good personal relations. Um, in the case with Indra. Uh, they have these disagreements, and it absolutely poisons the personal relationship. Uh, and Indira Gandhi never forgives her for those things. Manu, my last question before we end up this long and interesting discussion. What basically happened between Indira and Vijaya? What was the tipping point that the relation was never again the same? Great question. Uh, so first, you know, it's... Um, there's a popular misunderstanding that uh, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit uh, never got along with Indra Gandhi. Um, and, um, you know, there, this is accredited to various things, but famously Popol Jayakar pointed out that when she was young, Vijay Lakshmi had once said that Indra was neither beautiful nor, nor intelligent. Uh, and then there's the issue with uh, how uh, Kamla Nehru was treated. Those are the two main things, and it's just sort of taken at face value that uh, they had never had a good relationship. Let me just first say this is largely not true. I mean, this is essentially not true. Uh, Vijay Lakshmi and Indra had a very good relationship for most of their lives. Um, uh, Vijay Lakshmi, on many occasions, wrote and told her how beautiful she looked, uh, you know, that she was, she was uh, very, it, she was doing very well, she was very smart. Uh, and Indra had very close relations with the family and particularly with Nayantara and Chandraleka. Uh, they, they were very uh, tight knit. Um, now, at the same moment, she may, she, she may have harbored uh, issues about the treatment of her mother. She didn't really talk about those. That may have been something that Indra held close to her chest. She didn't really talk about about that. And Vijay Lakshmi did say um, that, you know, she regretted uh, much of how Kamla came to feel and um, in part how, how that relationship developed. Um, but nonetheless, I would say, uh, as far as any records I was able to see, 
and the 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 evidence is overwhelming that they had a pretty close relation and loving relationship. This extended all the way through uh, uh, Vijay Lakshmi's time in the High Commissioner's office in London, where Indra wrote her again affectionate notes uh, filled with gratitude uh, about all the things that Vijay Lakshmi was doing for her and for her children. Um, so uh, the real pivot point is um, later after um, Nehru dies uh, and Indra Gandhi enters the government uh, and Vijay Lakshmi, um, who holds Nehru's old seat in Pulpur, um, grows critical of the government. Um, and the press doesn't help anything. They keep ginning up this, it's some sort of fake, this controversy, this claim that there's this rivalry between them. Um, they keep writing stories about it. Um, it. That isn't really exactly what's going on. But Indira Gandhi grows increasingly paranoid uh, that there is something uh, to these stories. Uh, and she takes all this of paranoia, the paranoia, was it from the starting of her tenure or towards the end of her tenure? No, sort of right from the start, she starts to feel like there are these, uh, Indira Gandhi grows increasingly suspicious of her aunt. Um, and this eventually culminates in a moment when um, this, uh, the, in, in, in criticizing um, uh, uh, the, the Shastri government, um, uh, it, it basically comes to be this position where they, uh, uh, Indira Gandhi is sort of seeing this as as a tax on her. And after she becomes the prime minister, Indira Gandhi, um, uh, there's this moment where um, Vijay Lakshmi goes to see her. And uh, they're sort of sitting together in the office and uh, she just sort of confronts her and says, Vijay Lakshmi and says, can you just tell me what is going on? And she says, well, I don't trust you. Uh, uh, Poofy, I just don't trust you. And that is is this moment. Vijay Lakshmi just sort of gets up and kisses her on her forehead and says, well, thank you for being honest. Uh, and uh, it's sort of a, the tension comes out of the room because this has been building for some time. Uh, and essentially, uh, what it is, is uh, Indira Gandhi is thin-skinned. Uh, she takes criticism as personal attacks. Uh, this is, creates kind of this, and, sh and she's paranoid. And all of the features uh, which distinct, which sort of come out in more, more stark terms during the emergency are there from this period, the minute she starts having positions of leadership. Um, and uh, so, so there is this separation uh, from that point. Um, and then once the emergency comes into play, Vijay Lakshmi is placed uh, under house arrest uh, and, and monitored. Uh, and then, of course, she she campaigns against her her niece, and that's and the this final. relation and this relation between both of the players and never mended again. No, it never mended. No, uh, it, not it. It died not, down with Indra's death. Well, um, let me say it, it didn't mend not for not for want of Vijay Lakshmi trying. Um, she even after Indira Gandhi's defeat. Uh, in 1977, Vijay Lakshmi went to her and tried to maintain the personal affection, uh, but uh, it, that was just not something that uh, Indira Gandhi was was uh, willing to uh, tolerate. Um, uh, and so, from Indira Gandhi's point of view, the relationship never mended, um, and um, you know that was sort of the end of it from there. Um, the I, I need to clarify that the relationship with the rest of the family, however, was not harmed by this. Um, Vijay Lakshmi had a very affectionate relationship with, well, I, let me clarify, with Rajiv, uh, with Rajiv and uh, Sonia, and she also maintained good relations with Manika. Um, Sanjay, Sanjay? And Indra, yeah, no, they, they did not have good relations. They never had a good relationship, yeah, which is completely understood. Yeah, no, they they never had a good relationship. Vijay Lakshmi saw him as uh, as embodying all of the worst elements of of uh, his mother's personality, uh, and being also a, a, a very bad influence uh, on his mother. And so she, again, it was more about uh, the kind of values and and things he stood for 
Uh, those two did not have a good good relationship, but she had a great relationship with the rest of the family, and this is sort of made clear uh, all the way at the very end of her life, um, at her 90th birthday, she has the entire family uh, in her home, and they're, they're all there, and um, Rajiv calls her his grandmother, um, and uh, I mean, not, not just at the party, I mean, he, he thought of her as his, as his grandmother, um, and uh, they had a very, very affectionate relationship. Again, that didn't stop her from uh, commenting on political affairs and kind of separating her views of politics uh, from uh, uh, personal relations, and she remained outspoken until the end of her life. Um, one thing we can say about her, uh, she um, held high ideals, um, and she held true to those ideals from the beginning of her life through the famous middle of her life and all the way until the very, very end. Mr. Mr. Mono, thank you very much for talking to me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Let me hold your book once again so that it reads maximum readers. And I do hope that people buy and read and understand what Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit stood for. Thank you very much for thank talking to me. Thank you so much. Please subscribe to our channel Reportage and press the bell icon to remain updated.